Let me add to the welcome that's already been extended this morning. We certainly do appreciate you being here. We have a good crowd and very thankful that you have chosen to come and be with us. You know, I say we have a good crowd in spite of the fact that we do have a ton of folks sick. Um, if you have uh, avoided the flu at your house, you're a lucky person is all I can tell you. Uh, we have had our bout with it and it seems like many, many others have had their bouts with it as well. I hope and pray over these uh, next coming days that uh, uh, maybe you will avoid it, have the opportunity to enjoy time with your family and friend. So I might as well go ahead and get Merry Christmas out of the way. That way uh, I'll, I'll not forget to say that to you, and I hope that uh, coming days you'll get to enjoy family and friends. Ephesians chapter 5. While you're turning to Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to look at verses 26 and 27. This month we've been talking about the term glory. And from the Greek, it really simply means to boast. And we've looked at the fact of we are to glory or bring glory to God. We are to bring glory to the name of Jesus Christ. Last week, it was Nathaniel who was looking at glorying or glorifying or bringing glory to the Godhead. And each and every one of them have a differing role in, rela in relationship to the body of Christ. Uh, each of them have a very pertinent role in relationship to the things that they do. Today we're going to look at this concept of the church. A glorious church. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse it. Now if you'll circle that IT and go back to verse 25, you'll see that Christ gave, lo loved the church and gave himself for it. So that's the it we're talking about in verse 26. It's also the it we're talking about in verse 27. That he might present it to himself. A glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. But that it should be holy and without blemish. When you look at this concept. And by the way this term glorious is not the same Greek word that we've been looking at in regards to glory. Glorious means to be held in honor or of high repute. And we recognize and understand that when we're talking about the church, we're not talking about the facilities. We're not talking about this building. There's nothing uh, fancy, fancy or there's nothing magical or there's nothing uh, about this building other than the fact that God's church meets in it. Now, I've probably looked at this passage uh, wrong for many, many years. When you're looking at this and, and you see this without spot and without wrinkle or such thing, be holy and without blemish, I, I kind of wanted to make that an individual responsibility. And I may have preached on it in times past and talked about the fact that as Christians, we're to remain pure. And there's no doubt that that's true, and we could cite many other passages. But let's keep this in the context in which it is speaking. And that context is that it's talking about the church. And that the church is a glorious church, and it's not to have spot or wrinkle. It's interesting when you look at this concept of it, it's not talking so much about a moral immorality as it is a scriptural off base. Warning in regards to false teachers. Warning in regards to those that would uh, stray from the truth. That's the spot are the wrinkle that he's talking about in relationship to the church. Now, when you look at this, he's talking about a glorious church. And I, get, I ask myself the question, and I think Malcolm was afraid when he looked at this sheet of paper this morning and said, man, how long are you going to preach? Well, maybe not as long as you think. The, this first point's going to go really quick. It's, it's, it's going to go really quick. But... Have you ever thought about, and, and we're looking at this in, in relationship to 
here's something that I can brag about the church. What is it about the church that I ought to be able to approach somebody? I ought to be able to say, Hunter, did you know? And then fill in the blank. Hey, Brother C.A., did you know this about the church? Man, isn't that wonderful about the church? I can brag on that. Let me show you some points very quickly. First of all, did you know that the church is promised? Look at Matthew 16 and verse 18. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There's no other organization in this world that can say that it is promised by Jesus Christ. Only one church. That's Christ's church. All of these others are counterfeits. All of these others are, are situations where they've compromised the truth in one way or another. And that's what we're talking about this morning. We don't need to compromise the truth. We have a glorious church. This is the church that we're going to hand back over to Jesus Christ. Look at it. Verse 27. That he might present it how? To himself. This is what's going to be presented back to Christ. And he doesn't want it changed. He doesn't want the worship changed. He doesn't want the singing changed. He doesn't want the preaching changed. He wants it just like he gave it to us. And he promised that he would build that church. And in Acts chapter 2 that we see that he did just exactly what he said he would do. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, it says us, praising God and having favor with all the people, the Lord added to the church daily, such as we should be saved. Do you know that you can be added to the church today? If you're not a member of the body of Christ, you can be added right now. If you'll do just exactly what they did in Acts chapter 2, when they heard Peter preach a relationship to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, that he died that he was placed in that tomb, that he rose, and now he's ascended back to the right hand of God, and he's waiting to come back to this old earth. If you'll be obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ, you can be added to the church today. Don't have to wait. You know what? You can be added to the church, and guess what? I don't even have to ask somebody's permission. I don't have to wait on them to vote on me, because Acts 2 verse 47 says, the Lord adds to the church daily. It's not a committee. It's not a panel. It's not a group. When you are obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Lord puts you in his body. If you're willing to believe that he is the son of God, to repent of your sins, confess Christ, and be buried with him in baptism, the Lord will add you to the church. I want to brag about that church. I want to brag about the fact that I can be a subject in this church. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. The church is subject unto Christ. He's the head. That's what Colossians 1 verse 18 tells us. I don't have to wonder about who's the head. I don't have to wonder about where I'm going to get my direction. I don't look or wait for uh, some vision in the night because God has given me his word and it provides me everything that I need unto life and unto godliness. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. I can brag and, and I'd brag, make this brag with tears in my eyes. The purchase price of the church. When you look at verse 25 of Ephesians 5, as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. He gave himself for it. Jesus Christ died to purchase the church. What a sacrifice. Nobody else can make that statement. You know that this church is that which was planned. You back up to Ephesians chapter 3. You look at beginning in verse 8. Unto me who am less the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning... <coughs> 
The beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. To the intents now that unto principalities and powers and heavenly places might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. Now notice in verse 11, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus. The church is not a mistake, my friends. It was God's plan. It's God's blessing for us. We can also see that it's in the church in Ephesians 2 and verse 16 that we can be reconciled, as he says, in one body, made friends again in one body. Not only that, notice the fellowship in Acts chapter 2 and verse 44. And they were all together, had all things in common. That's one of the greatest blessings in relationship to the body of Christ. Um, I, I've, I've heard a lot of people say a lot of times about individuals, you know, that person would give you the shirt off their back. I have no doubt of that. I have no doubt if I needed something, I could go to Paul McCaleb and say, Paul, I need some help. He'd give me the shirt off his back. I believe that. Why? Because... Uh, Paul is rich and famous? No, because he's a brother in Christ. And I believe with all my heart that man loves me. I love him. We do things for each other. Where? In the body of Christ. Look around this auditorium this morning. How many people can you make that statement about? You ought to be able to make it about individuals. You know, uh, this year the Lord has blessed us greatly. And, and we've picked up several different families. And I'm not going to uh, try to name all of you because if I do, I know I'll miss some. But I, since I picked on Malcolm earlier, I'm going to say Malcolm. You, you, you know, wh what I love about Malcolm is, is Malcolm's friendliness. I, I, I love the fact that Malcolm gets involved and uh, I, I notice things in relationship to Malcolm as, as he's wanting to fit in. He makes an effort. Man, that's the body of Christ. I can say the same thing about Renee and, and, and Lyndon. I could, and I could say it about I, I, everybody that I know of that has come into the body of Christ here at Hinesville this year. What a blessing it is. There's no greater value than the fellowship which we enjoy in the body of Christ. And then the last thing, when you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 2 through 5, we see this concept of caring. This concept of caring. Here were the uh, saints that were in need and how the, uh, the items were being distributed among those. We, you know, we ought to care for folks. Our love is demonstrated, isn't it? Our caring is d demonstrated this year in relationship to hurricanes here and there and wherever, storms that we could help and benefit individuals. Where? In the body of Christ. That's the church. That's the church. It ought not be hard for us to tell somebody about the body of Christ. This is the place that we know and love and appreciate. But he makes three points here in Ephesians chapter 5. Paul does. He makes three points. First of all, he says that he might present himself a glorious church having spot, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. So first of all, the glorious church is seen in its purity. And you kind of just have to Ask yourself, how is this possible? Here's a statement I picked up from Brother Guy M. Woods. He glories consist in, in her purity without spot or stain upon her garments or character as pure and chaste woman true to her own husband. And notice that. Consisted in her purity. Now, I told you earlier, a lot of times I've, I've looked at this concept of without spot, wrinkle, or such thing. And, and, and I've wanted to talk about moral purity. And in this context, that's, that has reference to the wife in relationship to her husband. 
But also in this context, it's talking about the body of Christ. And in relationship to the body of Christ, that purity is seen in us how? It is seen in truth. In John 8 and verse 32, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Truth is truth even if no one believes it. A lie is a lie even if everybody in the world believes it. When, when the B-I-B-L-E tells you something, it's truth. That's what John 8 and verse 32, John 17 and verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. That's what it's telling you. You can believe it. It's true. When it tells you about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, it's true. When it tells you that he is raised from the dead, it's true. When it tells you that he's gone back to the right hand of God, he's waiting for a time that he's going to come back and that this old world is going to be dissolved, it's going to be burned up, and we're going to spend an eternity somewhere either in heaven or in hell. That's true. Now, what can I do about it? Well, the only thing you and I can do is get ready. Be prepared. So that on that day, you can hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful uh, servant. But in relationship to the truth, what can I do? The Bible tells me that I can stand for the truth. Stand up for what's right, even if you find yourself standing alone. In Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6, verses uh, 12, 11, 12, and 13, 14 in particular, having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with, and I want you to notice it, underline it, circle it, with truth. We're supposed to stand. Not only that, the truth needs us to defend it. Notice this old line up here. The truth is like a line. You don't have to defend it. Let it loose. And it'll defend itself. Statement by St. Augustine. It's true. The truth don't need defending. We just need to be the ones who promote it. We need to be the ones that present it. We need to be the ones that are going to stand there in relationship to it. The world can say uh, anything that it wants to say in relationship to morals. And, and if you look at the entertainment industry, uh, you'll see how warped our world is becoming in relationship to morals and things that are permitted and allowed and accepted. And then right on the other hand, the things that aren't. Who gets to decide those things? Uh, apparently, whoever has the biggest mouth makes the most noise is the one who gets to determine what's right and wrong. I'm going to tell you something. That's wrong. The truth is the truth. Always will be. We need to defend it. Don't you love Jude 3? Earnestly contending for the faith which has been once and as the Greek bears out, once and for all delivered. We need to defend it. Not only that, I love this one. What can I do with the truth? I need to carry the gospel with me everywhere I go. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. I have got to carry it with me far and near. I've got to carry it whether it's daylight or dark. I need to carry the gospel of Jesus Christ. Glorious is also seen in holiness. Separated from sins, that's what we should be, and therefore consecrated to God. How do you do this? How do we maintain holiness when it comes to the truth? Two points, put them up both at the same time. First of all, we need to learn how to listen. Secondly, we need to learn how to test what is being said. We need to learn how to listen. 
You know, Paul told Timothy, preach the word. That's what we ought to demand. We ought to be willing to listen. Uh, I, I think maybe some of us, uh, a lot of us here at Adamsville can say, well, you know, this past year, one of the things that we've learned to do better than what we used to do is we listen. We listen to what people are saying. We try to understand and we try to help. We have a responsibility to preach that word. We have a responsibility as a listener to accept that word and make application where that application needs to be made. Now, I wanted to just turn over to 2 Peter for just one second. 2 Peter, <coughs> excuse me, Let, let's, put this to ta uh, let's put this to the test. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, let's start in verse 20 and 21. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the, pro for the prophecy came not in old time by will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And then he starts in chapter 2, and he gives warning after warning in relationship. Listen to verse 2. Ch chapter 2, verse 1, there are many false prophets among the people. Many false prophets. Isn't that interesting? Then he tells them in relationship to these things that you have got to beware. Look at verse 18. 2 Peter 2, verse 18. They speak great swelling words of vanity. Are you listening? Are you listening? Just because somebody has a way with words doesn't make it the truth. Well, how in this world am I supposed to be able to ascertain the truth? If you will go back and read 2 Peter again, you will see that he says that it's the word of God that makes the difference. Look in chapter 3, verse 1. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in both which I stir up your pure mind by the way of remembrance. What was he trying to stir up in them? The things that they had heard and learned and been taught by the Word of God. That's what ought to stir us up. You can always check a false teacher. How? By comparing what they say with the Word of God. The last point this morning. Glorious in purpose. Oh, how glorious it is in relationship to what the purpose. All are partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. We are all partakers. We have this purpose to go into all the world. We have this purpose to share that gospel to those that are lost. We have this purpose and this purpose alone. And when you look at it, and we're doing what we're supposed to be, in purity, in holiness, and in purpose, then brethren, we've got something to brag about. That we can hold up to the world and say, I don't hesitate to recommend to you where I go to church, where the Bible says is exactly what it's supposed to be, Nothing's been added to it. Nothing's been taken away. Is that where you worship? What does the Bible have to say in relationship to the things that you do or don't do? If you're here this morning, you're not a Christian, you can become one. How? By the things we've discussed in relationship to believing, repenting, confessing, and being buried with him in baptism. 
If you've done these things, but yet you've fallen short of the glory of God, you need to come back to your first love. Won't you think about these things? If you need to respond, won't you come as together we stand and sing?